Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is the fifth in our foundational series. This time around, part two of our three part introduction to statistical populations micro series. If uh, you haven't already, I strongly advocate you check out the previous installments, um, including the channel introduction. Let's do a quickie recap. We have our classification or taxonomy, if you prefer, for describing different types of populations. Concrete versus non-concrete. And then within non-concrete, we have imaginary or abstract versus non-imaginary. Non-abstract, if you like. Okay, so uh, where did we leave off? A type of population that is mysterious, uh, perplexing, maybe controversial. Uh, if you will, allow me to introduce you to the so-called superpopulation. Uh, superpopulations are not uh, easy to talk about because, well, first off, they're uh, imaginary. Uh, and uh, I bet that if we asked uh, 10 scientists to offer t uh, their own description of a superpopulation, we'd probably get 10 pretty varied answers. Uh, okay, so what's all the drama about? It could be argued that uh, many, many statistical research results from clinical trials to those conducted in sociology, or politics, quality control, and just about every application in between uh, implicate a superpopulation. Um, and depending on one's chosen definition of superpopulation, it could be argued that all inferential or predictive statistics actually implicate a superpopulation and the only remaining question is how closely that uh, superpopulation actually uh, represents uh, some particular concrete population. So uh, here's a definition, I'll verbally offer some parallels. Uh, one way to think of a superpopulation is as an imaginary infinite collection of every element that could be a member of some concrete population of interest or an imaginary population from which some concrete population of interest could have been realized. Okay, what does this mean? A given concrete population had to have been materialized through some process, and we call that process nature. So the question is, couldn't that process or nature uh, just as easily have materialized other concrete populations similar to the one that was in fact actualized? So let's consider a couple examples. Thinking about imaginary students that don't exist but that could exist is pretty challenging. Uh, but you recall in our earlier edition, um, the idea of the thing itself, we made a point of the distinction between the essence of some things and the actual things themselves. Well, we can utilize that thinking here. Our students at this university will possess some essence of studentness at this campus. Um, we can imagine some abstract population that is made up of elements, people, students, that embody this essence. Uh, to attempt to simplify, um, let's turn to our uh, beloved bolt making machine. Uh, over some period of time, our machine faithfully cranked out uh, however many hundreds of thousands of bolts there. Um, and the essence of these bolts could be embodied by some imaginary and infinite population of bolts from which the actual concrete population could be a representative subset. The statistician uh, William Cochran coined the term superpopulation, I believe, in the 1940s, and as is commonly the case with language, the term has morphed since then. In our two examples, uh, the one with the students and the one with the bolts, uh, it's not too overwhelming, I don't think, for us to conceive of the superpopulations we described, and they seem pretty harmless and uh, maybe more of a curiosity than anything. There is a, a more modern view of superpopulations that perhaps isn't so harmless, um, and it is articulated very nicely by Professor Richard Burke, I believe now he's at uh, UPenn, um, in his book, uh, Regression Analysis, A Constructive Critique. When we observe something, our instinct is to generalize our observations into a larger understanding of how that something works. But is that something really what we think it is? Uh, if we were to get 100 students uh, to complete a survey at a university with a student body of, say, 10,000 students, can we use those survey results to draw conclusions about the whole population of 10,000 students? Or would these uh, survey results, in fact, be telling us about some other population? That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob.